Hey everyone, uh, we have Patrick from Blockstack. He'll be doing a talk on proof of HODL communities and I'll let him take it from here. Thanks. Hi, um, Patrick Stanley here, head of growth at Blockstack PPC and working on some new things as well. Um, today, I wanted to talk about proof of HODL communities. Um, now, can, you, can someone let me know if this is playing full screen for them? They can see this correctly. Great, all right, so going to full screen, thanks. So cool, so starting with the first question, um, is hodling an underexplored use case for cryptocurrencies? This is a thread I've been pulling since like October of last year uh, with some, some, uh, some guidance from uh, some folks in the crypto community like Joel Manegro and Balaji Shrinivasan. And um, I'm excited to kind of go into uh, exploring this topic. So let's take a look at the current crypto landscape. So number one, ICOs typically have thousands of purchasers and very few builders. And what that does is that creates um, a bunch of free riders. And I mean that in a positive sense, uh, not free loaders, um, but free riders who, uh, who benefit from the work of builders and tech evangelizers, but may not actually uh, do any work or even uh, get any utility out of the investment that they're that they're um, that they're purchasing, and so I kind of have these um, two circles. You know, one's very large. That's the folks who are participants in terms of um, purchasing the tokens. And then a very small uh, small circle who are the builders and tech evangelizers. And I think it'd be optimal if this were if you know, if those if those circles were kind of more equal or even if the builders and tech evangelizers um, became larger than, than the sort of size of number of people who uh, just purchase and then kind of might not do much else. Second thing is token volatility. So most tokens are an unnatural unit of exchange. I have a chart of Bitcoin Cash here on the right. Now Bitcoin Cash, um, I think the kind of like end goal for it is to be treated like like currency that you'd use, um, you know, and they um, they they're a fork of Bitcoin, larger block sizes, and the reality is the the size. Uh, sorry, the reality is um, these cryptocurrencies are really just too volatile to kind of like use in app uh, for payment. Like I've seen, you know, apps in the past like Peepith and others um, where you know you pay per tweet or um, you know, you try to they try to treat the token like it's currency inside of the app, and it, it just seems like incredibly backwards, uh, incredibly ham-fisted way of trying to find utility in a token. Um, whereas most people are probably just hodling um, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, um, and not using it for purchases. If we're being if we're being honest, and the three, the biggest winners ex uh, customer-wise. Are exchanges so you know 35 million people using Coinbase is kind of like the high water mark for a uh, crypto application. And um, most applications, most applications in crypto outside of exchanges don't come near 35 million people. And platform like there, there's an old quote in kind of like Silicon Valley venture uh, space where they say, you know. You start with a product, get to 100 million users, and then become a platform. Well, crypto is actually kind of like the opposite. You start with this platform in many cases, and, and you have to kind of build up to a larger uh, user base. And I think um, one of the things that folks are doing uh, when they buy crypto is, yes, some are using it, but it, some are using it for, um, for you know smart contracts and things like that, but not to the extent that people are are buying it and holding on to it for, um, for kind of like um, preserving wealth or growing their wealth. So the question I have is, what if we were to change the current landscape by bringing more utility to hodling? So hodling is already a very natural use case, and it might, and I, in my opinion, it might be actually under, uh, kind of underexplored in terms of um, kind of channeling that. That that use case into an experience. 
and so um wanted to wanted to bring up the concept of proof of hodl login so that kind of a haphazardly slapped together clip part of a key with a money bag essentially represents um, this concept of proof of hodl login where you enter in by signing with the tokens that you hold so you might hold bitcoin or uh, stacks or ethereum or link and that signing with the the tokens that your wallet essentially um gives like a new use case for those tokens um, and it also allows you to um sort of enter into an application experience or a chat where uh, other people who are hodlers are in it and uh, people who are not hodlers cannot get in it so that's um it's a fairly interesting concept and we'll explore a little further so ways of entering an application through proof of hodl are through earning the token, and we'll get to more of that later, purchasing it on an exchange or, or generalized mining. And applications can, uh, can probably uh, gate one, two, or three of, of these uh, uh, ways to get in. So you might, you might have you know, proof of mining HODL login, for example, um, that some apps might choose um, to show that you've done some work upfront. Uh, that's kind of objectively observable and doesn't need a third party. Um, other apps might say, okay, actually, if you're if you're a hodler and you've been holding on to these tokens for three months, you're in. Um, you kind of like you know proven that you are you are someone who is like you know like one of us. <laughs> um, and so, um, what this proof of hodl login function does is it actually creates a new class of uh, class of user stakers. So user stakers is a is a concept that really got socialized in my opinion it really got socialized um really got socialized by uh placeholder vcs uh joel manegro he has a really great blog post called thin applications where he goes into this this concept of using an application only if you're a staker and this and we'll, we'll discuss a little bit uh, this further as well and um, the minimum balance for entering could be really low. It could be, you know, it could be micro pennies like dust, or it could be very high. It could be, you know, ten thousand dollars. But I think um, kind of the the idea is the application creator can adjust that per whatever you know she wants. The last thing uh, that's pretty nice is that there's no transaction fee needed. So this is something that doesn't need to uh, doesn't need to clog the network. Um, you can just sign in with your wallet. There's no need to process a transaction, and you know, you know, spending three years working at Blockstack, like one of the things that we really uh, recognize is like running transactions for the sake of running transactions is is like fairly unnecessary. If you can do things off chain um, that that makes sense to do off chain, um, you should do them because um, it doesn't it doesn't um, it it's just more fluid that way and it's kind of like unnecessary to do otherwise so no transaction fee is pretty nice so um yeah so this this one quote from the thin applications blog post joel um joel had had at the way bottom it was actually kind of like tucked away um the bottom three bottom three paragraphs of, of that blog post are like really phenomenal and, um probably should have been at the top in my opinion so the quote goes, um, you know, user staking creates a kind of opt-in economic lock-in that benefits the user by turning them into stakeholders in success of the service. So this is like this is like a fundamental sort of thing. You're not just buying a token and holding it. You're buying a token with the the idea that you would opt in to an application experience through the proof of hodl login. And that proof of hodl login gives that that token more of a utility uh, upfront because it's kind of like um, it defines a community. And so <clears throat> once you're in, you can do a bunch of things to actually grow the, the proof of HODL community. And you know, this, can be, um, this can be referrals to new HODLers. So you essentially can have like an evangelism dashboard where you onboard, you onboard new people. They might, they might have to prove that they hold $10 of, of the currency, but they keep making outgroup arguments um, to pull more people in and can earn a reward for doing so. And, and that's better than than kind of making in-group arguments and you know kind of having conversations with each other on how pure we are in terms of you know uh, our hodling status. So it's more like um, you're kind of like leveraging value signaling instead of virtue signaling um, in a way, and 
and uh, kind of growing the pie of folks who uh, folks who uh, are doing are doing work and folks who are in the community. The other thing is building software for hodlers. So, you know, folks could create um, folks could create tons of different types of software like uh, exchanges, gambling apps, um, chats, uh, chat uh, sorry, chat rooms. Um, just like the list goes on, um, and you can kind of gate it with holding the token, um, and you can pay uh, kind of um, developers for building that software. The third thing is you can also uh, kind of operate the group uh, as a collective. So you can have um, collective goals, like you know, mining throughput hits a certain amount, or um, you know you get listed on certain exchanges, or um, you know, kind of like you can dream up, you can dream up a bunch of different collective goals and you can even like cohort it based on who came in or how much they're hodling or like, um, you know, which type of tasks that they have opted into as a, as a group and kind of like limit those options. So you have like self-selecting groups kind of like proving their, proving their worth. Um, so I'll give an example of kind of like how this could work. And this is kind of like a sort of like a tongue in cheek example just to just to kind of like, um, uh, you know, keep keep it in your memory, essentially. So the example is a Mars token, and so the Mars token is essentially like an affinity token with the goal of terraforming Mars and bu building a civilization there. So this would be like maybe something Elon Musk might be interested in. And so there's a lot of things you can do with the Mars token. So you can pay out evangelists educating about terraforming Mars, or they might want to do that on their own because. Um, they have a stake in the Mars token and, and want to see success of not just the token, but also the idea of civil, uh, terraforming Mars. Folks who have the token can do specific tasks like improve sentiment around key uh, keywords to combat pessimism. There are a, a lot of a lot of a lot of um, sort of um, a lot of like goals that groups have as uh, that groups have that they want to achieve. Uh, sometimes have uh, you know folks who are against that goal. Sometimes those Folks are literally journalists, for example, and you need to build up uh, kind of like a kind of like a like a decentralized media arm to kind of like you know make sure that the the story is being told correctly and and it's being told constantly and is t told in a correct or good light. Another um, another kind of interesting thing is that the anti Mars people uh, might not have access to all the community apps and chat because they're not holding the Mars token. So it's kind of um. The adage of uh, you know hodl like not so much an adage more so a quote like hodl or GTFO, and it's 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 um, it's something that <laughs> definitely exists here. And if people um, don't hodl, then maybe they don't have all the information. They should hodl first. Um, I mentioned earlier kind of bonuses for converting uh, other evangelists and builders. That's that's totally relevant. And those bonuses those bonuses could you know those bonuses kind of um, the amount of bonuses you can give out. Uh, would grow commensurate to the market cap of that token. Another thing is you can sort of map reduce large tasks, kind of like parallelize tasks that uh, into smaller ones for the for the collective uh, Mars token holding uh, group to uh, complete. Um, and then lastly, uh, maybe you agree to use the token uh, at some point in time in the future. You know, subject to certain milestones getting hit, um, or just like collective agreement. Like we're going to use this on a, on another planet or something. Um, obviously, that last example is probably the most whimsical, um, not maybe not to be taken seriously, but you get the you get the idea. And so, let's let's talk a little bit about um, kind of the utility of community. Um, it's kind of a continuum here, where on the way left you have Kickstarter, where you can be a consumer and and think that something that's getting built is very cool, but not necessarily have the ability to invest in it. To the degree that you would like to to do, um, so you're kind of left in this like consumer builder relationship where the consumer largely funds and um, largely funds the initial building of a product, and the builder has um, essentially the build the builder uh, is kind of like on their own to make good on that, um, which has its pros and its cons. But um, the consumers are not necessarily uh, left better off for being in service of of that product or idea. And the builder is uh, kind of carry the risk of, of uh, having to deliver that idea with, with not, not really so much the help of the consumer. So as you move right on the on the continuum, you see Coinless, which um, really like Coinless. Like I have a lot of respect for those those, uh, those folks there, but I'm I'm using their their uh, sort of logo as a placeholder for the ICO, where 
you might do a you might do a uh, token sale with you know thousands of stakeholders, and uh, it's kind of like known from the very beginning that you'll have uh, you'll have kind of like a small core group of builders who kind of represent the core project building, and then it's on them to make sure that they grow a community. But the stakeholders don't necessarily take part in that. They're kind of like passive like passive investors in a way. They might use some of the apps sometime down the road, but maybe they won't. Um, maybe they won't even be updated on what what apps are ha are, are are like um, being built. And I feel like that that model is is like that's like an improvement, um, but um, that's an improvement, and it's got its it's got its merits, and will obviously continue on throughout time. It's very straightforward, and. Um, but as we move even further along the uh, kind of uh, continuum of uh, utility of community, uh, you have proof of hodl communities, and these proof of hodl communities, um, essentially, you you could kick them off with just generalized mining. You could do it like that uh, if you want to do like a regulated token sale or token sale that doesn't uh, have uh, have certain uh, domiciles listed. You can do that. But what's interesting here is that. It's implicit in the model that the people buying the token would actually want to uh, use it to access the community that they're entering into. So this is a different relationship between the builder and the stakeholder. It's it's almost incumbent upon the builder to, um, or rather, it's it would almost be a waste of the bill of the of of resources for the builder to not want to uh, put their their users almost to work. Or um, or or have them essentially have them making those app group arguments or helping build, um, but um, but it, yeah, I think there's like a really close mapping of um, of like a investor to to user or it, like, actually it is it is like one and the same, um, and the expectation is if you don't like the experience as a user staker, um, you can liquidate your tokens and then go into another uh, proof of hodl community. They might be delivering in a different way um, on on their goals. So um, I think the real key here is like uh, the ability to exit uh, and immediately, very very soon, like immediately or very soon after entering in a new community, understand whether this is a place where you you probably want to be, you probably want to continue being a stakeholder or not. So you don't have to wait years and years and years uh, on on these things happening and just kind of sit on the sidelines. You can be an active member. Well, so other examples of proof of hodl communities are uh, newsletters. So, um, blanking on the name, but there's a fellow who um, uh, requires you know, like 200 of his um, of his uh, you know personal token coins to be held in order for him to continue uh, sending newsletters to to those folks. So those folks uh, who want access to his newsletter uh, are essentially um, by holding by holding a token, they're kind of working in in favor of of the new the value of the newsletter token, um, you know, being sustainable or you know worth worth owning. I know there's chat rooms. I think chat rooms are like super straightforward. And um, I think there's a I'll, I'll, in my next slide or two, um, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what could be cool that's done there. Um, services and apps. We kind of went over that. Um, you're just hodling, hodling a specific uh, app coin to get into it, as opposed to trying to have an app coin, um, you know, be used as money inside the app, which like really um, tends to be like a bad experience. I think, you know, more folks, more folks are probably uh, used to the idea of like uh, increasing their wealth and getting to understand a product, as opposed to uh, playing in like a game or you know something like that. I think gambling is probably a good one, and um, because you can essentially um, limit the folks who can gamble um, based on what their holdings are. So if, you know, uh, you can essentially say, you know, if you're, if you can't be affording, if you can't afford to gamble, you are not allowed in here. And there, you know, might be some good aspects of that. The affinity groups thing, I think is super interesting. If you can solve attribution uh, for um, kind of user staker contributors. Um, but essentially like if you were like very pro vegan and wanted the whole world to become vegan, you might start a proof of hodl coin for vegan for like dollar sign vegan, and uh, try to recruit more members. Uh, same with car, uh, you know, carnivory uh, being a carnivore. Um, so folks might you know write uh, write you know, pieces of uh, might write like blog posts and like create YouTube videos. Essentially, try to get the word out about about you know 
these affinity groups and even um, get folks to be uh, stakeholders in them. And the last thing which I, uh, I personally find very interesting is um, kind of like hodling ecosystems within current open protocols. So you can think about the Stacks community, the uh, Link Marines. Like imagine if there is a proof of hodl um, community for Link Marines where they're you know, creating memes and like having fun and like you really do have to have to hodl or GTFO. And you know, it kind of like separates the real uh, value, the real value signalers, you know, they could be pseudonymous still um, or anonymous or whatever. It, it, it differentiates, it kind of like separates the real holders from the people that say they're holders. And I find that very interesting if you're kind of trying to create like um, different strata uh, of uh, folks that are, that kind of talk the talk but don't walk the walk versus the folks that really do walk the walk and are, are holders because, um, and yeah, you, 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 kind of, you kind of see that all in crypto, but in the link community, it'd be super interesting. And the same for ETH and Bitcoin. Um, essentially creating like tight knit hodling communities um, for those those folks. Um, and and kind of like lastly um, for future consideration, I have this um, I have this concept called freehold uh, or permanent freehold, which uh, I love to take from the physical world into the digital world. So like the definition of freehold in the physical world is permanent and absolute tenure of land or property with freedom to dispose of it at will. So this is not rented property. This is true ownership of property. Um, you can, you know, you can hold on to until until you decide to let it go. Um, and in a in a proof of hodl community, yes, there might be proprietary governance, but there's a world where if you push an app uh, live via smart contract, you could potentially create a permanent freehold with proof of hodl access for that token. So it could be a simple chat room with an app experience. Um, but it'd be a place for hodlers alone to occupy uh, indefinitely, and um, and one that would be very difficult to take down. So you're kind of creating like these little enclaves where you can have ownership uh, in them uh, and access them, and, and and kind of like till the soil and like work, you know, kind of work the land, so to speak, of um, those digital communities. And so I find that kind of fascinating, and I'd love to see something like that be experimented with, just to see kind of what the outcome will be. So kind of in summary, uh, proof of huddle communities, you sign in with your token keys and the tokens utility is initially for access control and it, but it can be used for other things later. Uh, you'd either, either or uh, kind of earn, buy or mine to access. Uh, you can have proprietary governance. You don't need to, you don't need to create like a super complicated governance model necessarily. Um, it, it, in my opinion, I think there might be way more proprietary um, governance than uh, people would, uh, I think there's gonna be more proprietary governance in crypto um, in the future, um, just by nature of like, only so many people can actually care about a project um, or, or an app and um, people will have capital flight, the speed of light. So I, I think that's that's something that's totally reasonable um, for the majority of freeholds and proof of hodl communities. Um, yeah, to create stakeholders and success of the community. And I think, um, you know, it's kind of like three types of founders. There's like the engineer founder, the salesperson founder, and the third founder is like an increasingly, a third a third type of founder is like a very rare type, but very, very, very uh, kind of like potent. And that's the community founder. And so founders who are really good at leveraging community, I think are going to have, have a great time creating proof of hodl communities. Um, that's kind of like a new business model um, for growing an idea or a service. And then lastly, um, you know, you could create a permanent freehold for ideas or services. So if you wanted to create a permanent freehold for veganism um, or carnivory or going to Mars, um, you'd be able to do that and kind of preserving those ideas um, based on folks, uh, folks's uh, kind of stake, stake in them and willingness to kind of will those ideas forward as a, as a community. So that's all. Thank you so much. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm Patrick W. Stanley. This has been a blast. Appreciate it. Happy, happy to answer some questions.
Um, Shannon, do, if you know where I should um, be looking for the questions, let me know. Okay, so I want to hodl stacks, but I live in the US. I can't seem to find an exchange. For the stacks USDC trading pair, where can I purchase stacks tokens? Um, stacks tokens are not yet uh, trading in the US. Um, so I will not be able to sort of help you with that at the moment. Um, but I'd say um, kind of follow Blockstack on Twitter uh, and follow the mailing list and uh, or sus subscribe to the mailing list at blockstack.org. And um, when there's an update, uh, you get it there. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Philip, for the, the praise. You guys are you guys are too nice. Um, will Blockstack be offering Web3 staking for hodlers? Yeah, so uh, the Stacks token will be uh, a token that you can stake. And the really awesome thing about staking Stacks tokens that makes it a lot different from other altcoins is that you actually earn Bitcoin instead of earning more Stacks tokens. So we we use uh, Bitcoin as a way of securing our network through this uh, novel uh, mining mechanism called proof of transfer. And um, what that does is that secures secures networks, allows like all of our smart contracts to be kind of like um, kind of be like you know, you know Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin level security um, while uh, hodlers of stacks tokens, if they're using a, a what we call stacking, a stacking wallet, uh, would just kind of uh, uh, earn Bitcoin, um, and so they're kind of participating in the uh, kind of work of the network. Cool. So, hi Patrick. Greek, uh, could this concept work for membership organizations, charities, and associations? What are your thoughts on how this might be developed? I, be honest, like I think this is like a potent concept that ha that is like a complete blank space for like really artful founders and leaders to uh, in communities to uh, to utilize. So um, I feel like um, for charities, for charities, um, I haven't thought about charities. I think like um, it, it totally depends on how you structure it. Like you could you could have a model where these proof of huddle tokens actually actually. Um, you know, have some stake that is just uh, that just um, kind of yields uh, kind of yields additional uh, app coin or stacks coin or Bitcoin through the proof of transfer model I message I, I mentioned earlier, and that goes to charity. Or you could have like um you could have like a group that is just all about um you know like social justice or whatever. And if you're really about that life, you'd you know buy you buy the token, be a part of it, and and like the sort of now, if, if the treasury is expanding as a function of that, you could pay for um, certain activities to be done um, or kind of like coordinate your community there. And Randall asks, is Blockstack blockchain agnostic? Does it have interoperability? Um, you, you should ask some these more technical questions I think would make sense to ask on the Blockstack uh, forum. But um, Blockstack, Blockstack can be blockchain agnostic in terms of uh, what we're what we b believe in is that Bitcoin is like the king of proof of work, and we want to leverage the heck out of that to secure our network, as opposed to trying to uh, create a separate uh, sort of proof of work. And in terms of interoperability, we've you know we've partnered with Algorand, um, so just uh, just the gang of us, and we're. Um, Sorry, there's some feedback there. I think Shinzu. Um, yeah, we partnered with Algorand, and um, we're both using Clarity smart contracts. So I think there'll be some interoperability there. So it'd be cool. All right, cool. So we're out of time now. We need to transition to our next talk. Thanks so much. Thanks. See you. Thanks.